Good morning, church family. Before we get started this morning, I just want to give one last invitation to the men's retreat starting this Friday. Last I heard, we had 42 men signed up and ready to go, so it is looking like it is going to be a fantastic weekend. Men, if you are signed up, today is the day to make sure that you get paid and sign your waiver form. Uh, Bruce Lambert was leading the team this morning, and he'll be back up at the end of the service. So guys, if you need to take care of that, go straight to Bruce, and he'll get you taken care of. If you didn't sign up, and right now you're having that little pain of regret saying, I might have missed out, come talk to me today. We'll find a way to make it happen. We don't want anybody to get left behind. So guys, come be a part of that. It is going to be a fantastic weekend together. Well, today we are continuing on in our series through the book of John. We're in the second half of chapter 18. So you can begin making your way there. Last week, Timothy Atkins walked us through the first half of the chapter. And one of the things that stood out last week was the contrast between Judas in his betrayal of Jesus, where Judas thought that he was in control. He thought he could set the terms of his life. He thought he could get one over on Jesus. We see the contrast between that and the sovereignty of God displayed in Jesus, who even as he's allowing himself to be arrested, even as he's allowing himself to be bound and led away, is in complete control. And nothing happens outside of his will. And today in the second half of the chapter, we're going to be seeing another contrast between Jesus in his faithfulness, his faithfulness to who he is and the mission that he is on. We see that contrasted with a lack of faithfulness on the part of Peter. And it's important for us to see what we're going to see from someone like Peter because we could look at Peter as one of the supreme examples of Christian faith. Peter was with Jesus from the beginning. Peter was the one who stepped out of the boat and walked on water. Peter was the, the one who declared, you are the Son of God. In the book of Acts, we see Peter stepping to the forefront among the apostles and leading the early church. We see Peter as the tip of the spear as the gospel goes out into the Gentile world. Peter is an ultimate example of faith. But here we see Peter failing. And it teaches us what it looks like for us to fail and to recover from that failure. Well, let's pray before we get into the word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for its truth, for its authority, for its wisdom. And this morning, as we approach your word, we invite your spirit to come and work in our hearts. Would you speak directly to each one of us? What we need to hear from you today, would you encourage, challenge, convict, and change us? In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to read the, the middle portion, actually, of chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. Then the detachment of soldiers, with its commander and the Jewish officials, arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back and spoke to the girl on duty and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? 
If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servant, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the rooster began to crow. So coming back to the first few verses, John introduces us to two individuals, Annas and Caiaphas, both of whom, throughout this account, get referred to as the high priest. And so at first, there seems like a little bit of a confusion, a little bit of a contradiction, that both of these men get referred to as the high priest. It's interesting that at, in the beginning of Luke's gospel, in Luke 3, 2, when he is describing John the Baptist's ministry, Luke writes that his ministry took place during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. That's an interesting phrase because priesthood is in the singular, but it's attributed to two men. And it reminds me of Jesus' statement in the Great Commission. Where he says, go and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The one name of the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here Luke attributes the one high priesthood to two men, Annas and Caiaphas. What's going on? Well, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 35, we read that the high priesthood was a position that was held for life. Once somebody has that position, they have it for life. But now, under Roman rule, the Romans came in, and one of the ways that they exerted their power over the Jewish community was by regularly replacing the priesthood. It reminds me of the time I spent in China, where Chinese Christians have one of two options. Either they can be a part of the officially sanctioned government church, or they can go underground and meet in the illegal, secret underground church. But if they're going to meet in the official government-sanctioned church, one of the compromises that they have to make is that the highest official who oversees that government church in China has to be a member of the Communist Party. And to be a member of the Communist Party, you have to be an atheist, which means that the highest official overseeing the church is an atheist. That's a difficult situation to live under, but they do that to exert their authority the authority that they think they have over the church. And so now here, the Romans are exerting their authority over the Jewish community by replacing the high priest. Now it says Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas. Actually, Annas was the patriarch of a priestly dynasty. Over 62 years, Annas had five sons, one son-in-law, and one grandson who each served as priests. So even though the Romans are changing out the priests, most of the priests that they're appointing are from this one family, and they keep coming back from this one family because this one family is willing to do whatever it takes to appease the Romans. And we ask, okay, they have this family dynasty that controlled the priesthood for such a long time. What was that family like? In the Jewish Talmud, which is collected in the 4th century, it's writings from this time, and it describes the popular opinion of Annas and his priestly dynasty. In the Talmud, we read, Woe to the house of Annas. Woe to their serpent's hiss. They are high priests. Their sons are keepers of the treasury. Their sons-in-law are guardians of the temple. And their servants beat people with staff. We read in John about the market and the taxation system that had developed around the temple system. That, that market was referred to as Annas' Bazaar. It was controlled by him, and his family was the ones who profited from it. And so when Jesus comes into the temple, overturning tables and kicking out the money changers, this is the family who's, who's being affected by that. And so they want to get rid of Jesus. And they're the ones that are behind this this push we see in the first half of the chapter to go and have Jesus arrested and brought to trial. 
It says in verse 14 that Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. We read about that in John chapter 11. Let's turn back there really quick. This is right after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. He's raised someone from the dead. Imagine that. How should people respond to a sign of God's power like that? But it says in verse 45, Therefore many Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. This man is performing many miraculous signs. They recognized Jesus performing miracles and that those miracles are signs from God. But even though they recognize that, they say, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And so when they're confronted by the miracles of God, God's power on display, they're more concerned with their position and their control. And so then it goes on to say that one of them, Caiaphas, who is the high priest that you spoke up, you know nothing at all. Don't you realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation should perish? He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he had prophesied, this is a prophecy from God, that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but for the whole, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So he thought that what he is prophesying is that if they kill Jesus, everything will be okay. But what God is saying is that Jesus is going to die to take away the sin, not only of that nation, but of the entire world. So they arrest him, and they bring him first to the house of Annas, who is called the high priest. He had been the, the high priest, and then he had been removed, and now his son-in-law is officially the high priest, but the, Jew, but the Jews continue to think of him as a high priest. And so they bring him first to the house of Annas, and what we're going to read in John takes place there. And then after they leave Annas's house, they're going to go to Caiaphas, and, and Jesus will be tried with Caiaphas before the Sanhedrin, which isn't recorded here. It's recorded in the other Gospels. We'll take a look at that today. And from there, he goes on to Pilate. But as Jesus is being led in, John jumps back and forth between Jesus and Peter. And Jesus and Peter. It's like watching a movie where two things are happening simultaneously. And jumps back from one scene to the other. And John's the only one who sets the story up this way. But I think he does it to help us see the contrast between what's going on with Jesus and how Peter's responding. And so it says in verse 15 that Peter and another disciple, we know that's John, we've talked about the fact that John doesn't refer to himself by name in his writing, but Peter and John are following Jesus. In the other Gospels, it says that John went right in, but Peter followed at a distance. That's an important thing to to recognize because it shows what's going on in Peter's heart and Peter's mind that he's hanging back. He's following at a distance. We saw in the garden when he jumped forward and he slashed the ear of the high priest's servant. And we think, oh, he was being bold. I don't think he was bold. I think he was being scared. I think he was acting out of self-preservation. And now I think that sense of self-preservation has kicked in and Peter's hanging back. He's following Jesus at a distance. And I think that there's sometimes that we do that same thing, that we hold back. We follow Jesus at a distance. We're afraid to get too close. We're afraid to step out, to put ourselves out there, to take a risk. And so we hang back. But Peter's hanging back. He's following Jesus at a distance. Finally, he's brought in. And in verse 17, the servant girl there asks him, you're not one of his disciples, are you? And here it is, that fateful moment. Peter simply says, I'm not. I'm not a follower of Jesus. That's not who I am. What happened? Peter had this this moment where he was caught unprepared. 
where he was, gave in to his fear. And because of that, he denies being a follower of Jesus. And I think this moment had to have stuck with Peter his entire life. Because when he writes his letter to the church, he writes about being prepared. And so in 1 Peter 3, 14, we read, Even if you should suffer for, for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. What was Peter in the story? He was frightened. He says, do not be frightened, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord and always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. If we're not prepared, if we haven't thought through what we'll say, we might be caught like Peter off guard. And you know the places in your life where you're likely to be challenged, where somebody might say, you're not a Christian, are you? How could you believe in that? Or maybe there's just something going on and it's easier to hang back because you're not prepared. And so Peter says, prepare yourself. That doesn't mean you need to have a tract in your pocket to, to pull out. It doesn't mean you have to go through the four spiritual laws or the Romans road, but it means be ready to tell somebody what Jesus means to you. Be ready to tell somebody what God has done in your life. You know, Paul, at the end of Ephesians, talks about our daily practice of putting on the armor of God, preparing ourselves for the day, preparing ourselves for the situations we might encounter. And Paul says, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet, here it is, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You have the gospel of peace. So be ready, be prepared to give an answer. But Peter is not ready, he's not prepared, and he gives the wrong answer. He says, I am not. And then this next verse seems innocent, but there's something in it that I want to catch before we move on. It says that it was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire. If you're, some of your texts might say they stood around a charcoal fire. And this word is actually describing uh, of embers laid out. But this is only one of two places in the entire Bible that this Greek word is used. And we've seen something like that happen before. And every time we see a phenomenon like that, it almost always leads us to extra insight. You might remember when we were working our way through 1 Timothy, and we saw Paul describing the way that the elders take care of the church. And he used a word to describe their care for the church. And we said that word was used only one other place. You remember where it was? Is the parable of the Good Samaritan. The way the, the Good Samaritan finds the man bleeding along the side of the road and he bandages his wounds and he puts him on his donkey and he takes him to the inn and he cares for him. And so that picture gives us a picture to have in our minds as we think of what it looks like for the elders to care for the church. And so here we have another instance where we have a word that's used only one other place in the entire Bible, and that place is in John 21.9. In John 21.9, Peter comes in from fishing, and there's this bed of coals that's been prepared. And beside that bed of coals, he meets his risen Savior. And Jesus gives him the opportunity three times to affirm his love. Three times he's denied him. Jesus gives him the opportunity three times to affirm his love, and he restores him. But I think the connection of that word is important because it's almost as though Jesus has prepared, he's recreated this scene. He brings Peter back to this moment, to that moment of his denial. And he helps Peter with his senses to tap in to the emotions of that moment as he gives him a chance to do it over. Well, from there, John jumps back to Jesus. We see Peter in his failure, and then we see Jesus in his faithfulness. It says in verse 19, meanwhile, the high priest, this time the high priest refers to Annas. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and teaching. And Jesus says, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in the synagogues. Nothing I've done has been in secret. And he's pointing out the contrast. He says, you are the ones who are operating at night. 
You are the ones who are having this secret, false trial. You are the ones who are operating in darkness. I've done everything in the daylight. I have nothing to hide. And then one of the officials strikes him and says, is this the way you answer? And again, Jesus says, if I did anything wrong, tell me what I did wrong. But if I didn't do anything wrong, why are you hitting me? He's shining the light on their injustice by his complete faithfulness. And then it says in verse 24 that from here, Annas sent him still bound to Caiaphas. And we don't have the, re- the account of his meeting before Caiaphas in John's gospel. But if you jump to verse 28, it says, after that, then the Jews led him from Caiaphas to Pilate. So if we want to fill in this gap, we need to turn to one of the other Gospels. So let's look at Matthew chapter 26, where we get to read about this second trial before Caiaphas. Matthew chapter 26, uh, it's a long passage. We don't have it on the screen, but we'll go through it quickly. And it starts in verse 57. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas. The high priest were the teachers of the law, and the elders had assembled But Peter followed at a distance. There it is. There we see Peter hanging back, following at a distance. Right up to the courtyard of the high priest, he entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. And the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. So who's here now? Now we have the entire Sanhedrin, the chief priests, teachers of the law, the elders. This is their best attempt at an official trial. And it says they did not find any witnesses, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. They're referring back to what what Jesus said in chapter 2. He said, destroy this temple. He's talking about his body and he's prophesying about his death and resurrection. He said, destroy this body and I will raise it again in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, aren't you going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And in my translation, it says, yes, it is as you say. The Greek phrase is a little bit harder. It's su epos, you say I am, but it's meant to be taken as an affirmative answer. And then he goes on to say, Jesus replied, but I say to you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. He's talking about Daniel 7.13, and he's taking that passage and applying it to himself. He's claiming divinity. There's no doubt about it. And they recognize that. And so the high, high priest tears his clothes and says, he has spoken blasphemy. He is claiming to be God. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you. And then if we come back to John, he returns to Peter. But before we come back to Peter, I just want to... Look at the contrast that John is drawing out for us between Jesus' perfect faithfulness as he allows himself to be bound and beaten in Peter's denial. And it makes me think of what Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2. In 2 Timothy 2, 11, Paul gives us four if-then statements. Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. In Romans 6, when Paul's talking about baptism, he says that in baptism we were buried with him into his death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we may live a new life. Paul says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. And so here's a trustworthy saying, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. And then he says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. 
In Revelation, when Paul is writing, sorry, when John, the same John that wrote this gospel, is writing to the churches, he says, the one who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. If we endure, we will reign with Jesus Christ. But then he says, if we disown him, he will disown us. Now, this phrase, even though it's using the same English word, this isn't of these four if-then statements, this isn't the one that's talking about Peter. Because here it's talking about if we refuse to believe, if we reject who Jesus is, we are rejected by God. So what John said in John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son of God will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. If we believe, we have eternal life. But if we reject who Jesus is, God's wrath remains on us. And then the fourth if-then statement is the one that talks about Peter. It says, if we are faithless, if we fail, if we can't live up to that calling, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Praise God that our assurance that our perseverance does not depend on our ability to live up to a standard, but it depends on Jesus' perfect faithfulness. Amen? And that, for me, that's one of the biggest takeaways of this story, that Peter failed. He is not faithful to his Savior in this moment, but he can be restored because his perseverance, his assurance, does not depend on his ability it depends on his Savior. Well, let's come back and look at Peter's second and third denials in his response. John actually records this very succinctly. The other Gospels give a little bit more detail, but John says, as Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, you are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servant." A relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the rooster began to crow. Now, I think in John it's recorded very succinctly for us because I think that John's gospel is based on John's observation. John was there, he saw what happened, and he's writing it down for us. But if we turn to Luke's gospel, let's go to Luke chapter 22. Now, Luke was the historian, and Luke investigated things. And I believe in Acts, we can make the conclusion that Luke had met Peter, and I think he had interviewed Peter. And I think that what we have in Luke's gospel shares a little bit of Peter's firsthand account. And it gives us a little bit more of a sense of what Peter noticed in the moment, what Peter was struck by, how Peter experienced that event. Because he gives, exam here, he gives some information that only Peter would have known. It's interesting, of all the Gospels, Luke doesn't record anything about Jesus' trial before Annas or Caiaphas. But he focuses completely on Peter. So in Luke 22, starting in verse 57, he says, Then seizing him, Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. There Peter is holding back, following at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. We're already getting more detail, a more vivid description of what was happening around Peter. But she looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. And about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. In Matthew's gospel, Peter begins calling down curses. He, he makes an oath saying, I do not know him. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And only Luke records this. Only Peter 
would have known this. Verse 61, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. There's that moment when his eyes are fixed on his Savior and his heart is laid bare. He understands what Jesus is doing on his behalf, what Jesus is enduring on his behalf. And I think he is just broken by his inability to follow in his Savior's footsteps. He is broken by his sin. And there are times that we are in sin that we need to have that moment when we feel the gaze of our Savior looking on us and laying our heart bare. It said, he remembered the words spoken to him. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. He wept for his sin. The last contrast that we have is between Peter's response as he weeps over his sin and the response of Judas when he realizes what he has done in betraying Jesus. Because Judas, when he realizes what he's done, he hangs himself. He experiences a worldly sorrow that leads him to despair. But Peter experiences a godly sorrow that leads him to repentance and results in restoration. And so when we feel that conviction of sin, we need to make sure that it doesn't lead us into a worldly sorrow that results in despair. But we need to make sure that it leads to a godly sorrow that leads us to repentance, to owning our sin, to confessing our sin, to receiving the forgiveness for our sin, to get help, for our sin if we need to get help so that we can be restored. Worldly sorrow leads to despair, but godly sorrow leads to repentance and results in restoration. That's the end of the passage. But what's the application? What do we take away from that? I think there are four things. The first thing that I take away from this story is that we can take comfort in the faithfulness of Jesus. Isn't that comforting to know that your assurance does not depend on your perfection, but your assurance depends on the perfect faithfulness of Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. The second thing I take away from this is don't follow Jesus at a distance. If there's some place that you're holding back, some place that you know you're needing to step out, someplace that you're needing to draw close. Don't follow Jesus from a distance. One example that comes to mind is baptism. We're going to have another baptism service in a few weeks. And Jesus said, go make disciples, two things, baptizing them and teaching them to obey. That proclamation is an essential part of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So if you have not taken that step, come straight to me after the service and talk to me about it because we want to help you take that step. But there might be other ways that you are following Jesus at a distance, that you're holding back. You don't want to step forward. You don't want to get involved. You don't want to get connected. It's easier to stay in the shadows. It's time to step forward, to jump in with both feet, and stop following Jesus at a distance. Number three is to grieve your sin with a godly sorrow. When you have sin in your life, it needs to hit home. You need to feel that gaze of your Savior and weep like Peter weeped. But it's not a sorrow that leads to despair. It's a sorrow that leads to repentance and restoration. And finally, we need to be prepared. Be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. Be prepared to tell the world about your relationship with your Savior. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your perfect faithfulness. And we delight in the fact that...